Dr. Craig for eight minutes. Now you'll remember in my opening speech I presented six reasons why I think it's plausible that God exists. The first of these was the argument from existence. Notice that Dr. Daisy did not address this argument. He completely skipped it. This is the argument that says that anything that exists uh, has an explanation of its existence either in its own nature or in an external cause. The universe exists and therefore there must be an explanation for the existence of the universe plausibly uh, a mind which is beyond space and time. That argument has gone unaddressed in this evening's debate and so still stands. What about the second argument, however, based on the origin of the universe? Here Dr. Dacey attacked the premise that the universe came into being and he quoted Brian Greene as saying the Big Bang Theory is not a theory of cosmic origins. Well, I just simply beg to differ. That is not true. Uh, according to Barrow and Tipler in their book The Anthropic Cosmological uh, Principle, at this singularity, that is the beginning of the universe, space and time came into existence. Literally nothing existed before the singularity. So if the universe originated at a singularity, we would have truly a creation ex nihilo, that is out of nothing. Now PCW Davies, the British physicist in his recent book about time points out that recent ideas in quantum physics have changed our picture of the origin of time somewhat. But he says the essential conclusion remains the same. Time did not exist before the Big Bang. So as Davy says in his article, The Birth of the Cosmos, what caused the Big Bang? One might consider some supernatural force, some agency beyond space and time as being responsible for the Big Bang. Or one might prefer to regard the Big Bang as an event without a cause. It seems to me, he says, that we don't have too much choice, either something outside the physical world or an event without a cause. And I think it's far more plausible to believe that there is a transcendent cause of the origin of the universe than that it popped into being out of nothing. Certainly, Austin Dacey is correct in saying the theory is not incomplete, but I think uh, is not complete. But I think it's uh, undeniable which direction the evidence points. The evidence points clearly to the origin of the universe at some time in the finite past. He also then suggests that God cannot be the cause of the universe because causes precede their effects in time. But what I would argue here is that you can have simultaneous causes and effects. Sometimes the cause and the effect exist simultaneously. And I would say the moment at which God causes the Big Bang is the moment at which the Big Bang occurs. So that God's decision to create the universe is a decision for him to enter into temporal relations with the space-time universe and that therefore this is a simultaneous cause and effect. Notice that uh, although he challenges the notion of creation out of nothing, on the atheistic view you have a double incoherence, namely you have the or origin of the universe uncaused out of nothing. On the theistic view there may not be a material cause, but there is a productive cause. On atheism, if the universe began to exist, you have neither a material nor a productive cause, and I think therefore atheism is far less plausible. What about the third argument, the fine-tuning argument? Here, Dr. Dacey took the remarkable position that there really isn't any fine-tuning, that the fine-tuning um, may be done away with by some sort of a unified theory. Well, I think that is not going to happen. Any sort of final unified theory we have will still have these fine-tuned parameters. Ernan McMullen, in his uh, article, Anthropic Explanation in Cosmology, uh, in the year 2003, he's a philosopher of science, says it seems safe to say that later theory, no matter how different it may be, will turn up approximately the same numbers. And the numerous constraints that have to be imposed on these numbers seem both too specific and too numerous to evaporate completely. So I don't think there's much hope that uh, you're going to get rid of the fine tuning in some uh, final ultimate theory. It's noteworthy that even in string theory, you have uh, these fine-tuned parameters. Notice that Dr. Dacey did not deny that if the fine-tuning exists, it must be the result of uh, some sort of intelligent mind. He simply tried to show that it didn't exist, but if it does exist, certainly intelligence is the best explanation. What about the moral argument for God's existence? 
Here, he says that even though God does not exist, objective moral values still exist. And I would simply challenge him to explain to us why, on atheism, human beings are special. Why think that human beings have value? Now, he suggested, and also says this in his book, that it's our capacity to suffer and have projects. But clearly all kinds of animals have the capacity to suffer. And as for having projects, well, even beavers uh, have projects, uh, like making a dam across the stream. So the capacity to suffer and have projects, I don't think in any way shows that human beings are invested with objective moral value. In any case, even if we were different in that sense, why does that mark us off as being objectively, morally, intrinsically valuable? It's just arbitrary on atheism. On atheism, we're just animals, and animals aren't moral agents. As J.P. Moreland, a Christian philosopher, has written, on the evolutionary scenario, human beings are nothing special. The universe evolved to us through a blind process of chance and necessity. There's nothing intrinsically valuable about human beings in terms of having moral, non-natural properties. The view that being human is special is guilty of speciesism an unjustifiable bias toward one's own species. So I don't think Dr. Dacey has been able to make plausible tonight that if there is no God, you can still save objective moral values and the value of human beings. He says, but how does God ground moral value? Well, simply, the moral nature or character of God is the good. God is by nature, essentially, loving, kind, generous, just, and so forth. And this nature expresses us itself toward us in the form of divine commandments, which then constitute our moral duties. What about the resurrection of Jesus? He suggests that perhaps Joseph may have moved the body of Jesus. Well, this was a theory suggested back in 1922 by Joseph Klausner and has been almost universally rejected by contemporary criticism. Number one, there's no basis in history for such a hypothesis. That criminal's graveyard he spoke of was only 50 to 600 yards from the place of the crucifixion, so Joseph could have placed the body there directly. There was ample time to do the simple preparations from the, for the burial. The Jewish practice was always to bury on the same day as the day of execution, and Jewish law did not permit the body to be moved except in the case to the family tomb. So there's no evidence for the hypothesis that Klausner suggested. But secondly, if Joseph had moved the body, then the Jewish authorities would have pointed out the disciples' stupid blunder when they began to proclaim his resurrection from the dead. They would have had to simply point to where Jesus' body was placed by Joseph, and they would have nipped the Christian movement easily in the bud. As for what he says about the appearances and the origin of the Christian faith, I simply want to point out uh, that he goes against the majority of New Testament critics here. It is universally acknowledged among New Testament critics that the original disciples came to believe that God had raised Jesus from the dead and that they had these uh, visual experiences of Jesus alive after his death. They go far beyond the bounds of anything that the case books in psychology can explain on the basis of hallucinations. And therefore, I think there are good grounds to believe that they were right. They were telling the truth. Jesus had risen from the dead. And therefore, that shows that God exists.